Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to the second lecture on Ram Manohar Lohia. Today we are going to discuss his views on caste and class and also his views on socialism. In the previous lecture we have discussed um, Ram Manohar Lohia, his personal political life and also the uh, philosophical uh, basis of his thought and his ideas on caste, um, on socialism or on um, language or a lot of uh, social hierarchy and how to uh, rebuild or reconstruct Indian society according to the principle of socialism and what should be the basis of that socialism and how that is different from uh, the European models of socialism or many scholars arguing about um, uh, democratic socialism in India also. So, uh, today we are going to focus basically uh, his thought on uh, caste and class and also on gender and in that we will uh, discuss how his approach differ from many social scientists or scholars who are talking about these uh, social categories, but they uh, uh, differ very substantially from Lohiaites kind of approach to understand all these uh, categories and see them together to understand the stratification or the social hierarchy that we have in India and then how to remove that hierarchy or build a new society. So, that we will see um, through uh, Raman or Lohia and then we will also discuss his views on socialism and in the next lecture we are going to discuss his views on um, language and uh, how his uh, understanding of language differs very much from uh, the many caricature that we now come to associate with Lohia when it comes to um, understand or when it comes to recognize or engage with his views on language. So, uh, as I was discussing in my previous lecture, there is a kind of uh, tendency uh, uh, when it comes to uh, engage with Lohia. Among the followers, there is uncritical um, uh, submission uh, to uh, Lohia and his thought. And uh, those who are uh, critique, they, uh, they have a kind of caricature of Lohia even without uh, engaging with his text for uh, and uh, not to say about uh, not engaging critically with his uh, thoughts and ideas which is very relevant uh, certainly in our contemporary times. So, today when we will discuss his views on caste and class, we will realize that approach he is talking about is becoming more and more uh, relevant in social science discourse whether it comes to uh, moving away from Eurocentricism or excessive reliance on the concepts or methods produced in uh, non uh, produced in uh, western European societies and then applied in uh, India to uh, explain or to interpret uh, Indian society or Indian rea uh, reality or the intersectionality that is now coming together or taking into account different um, uh, uh, different aspects or different um, um, different layers or different levels or different categories which produce uh, social hierarchy, social exploitation and take them together to understand how these uh, hierarchy be it caste, class, gender, language comes together to form or produce. Uh, 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 hierarchy or exploitation in everyday um, everyday uh, lives. So, uh, Lohia uh, is becoming more and more relevant uh, even uh, in contemporary times and yet there is a kind of conspicuous silence about engaging with his thought critically even among this many scholars and so that is not to say there is no resurgence. So, in certainly last 5 
or 10 years there is a kind of re-emergence of interest in Lohia and his writings. But certainly for a very long time after death of Lohia, there has been a conspicuous silence and what were the reason for such silence? We have discussed in the previous lecture because of his uh, politics or because of his um, uh, critique certainly to um, uh, 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 Nehru, uh, to English and to the upper caste domination in public and political life of India. There are some of the reasons which actually led to the kind of silence that uh, we have seen for a very long time when it comes to engaging with Lohia and his thoughts. So, to understand uh, his thought on caste and class or to understand this social stratification in India. So, many social scientists or scholars and uh, political leaders or thinkers have uh, tried to explain uh, the root cause of caste and how to see caste in relationship with other um, uh, 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 categories be it gender or language or religion and we have discussed uh, through say uh, certainly with uh, B. R. Ambedkar his theorization of caste and how to eradicate the caste. You will find uh, Raman Norlohia having uh, a very different approach or more holistic approach to understand this problem also the intersectionality. So, he is not reducing the uh, social cleavages or uh, hierarchies to any one particular category be it class or caste or gender. So, he is taking a more broader and holistic approach to understand social hierarchy. So, while dealing with this question of social stratification, these social scientists have referred to many categories. So, caste, class, gender, language and ethnicity and religion and many such like categories to understand social reality or to understand the hierarchy or stratification of Indian society. However, their approach to this question can be broadly divided into two broad categories. First is among those which deals with a singular category. So, you will find many text, many speeches, many writings taking into account any one category be it caste or be it language, be it gender to understand or explain the social uh, reality or the um, uh, hierarchies in Indian society. However, on the other hand, you will find the individuals taking into account multiplicity of these factors. So, maybe two or more and all of them together to understand the Indian society in a more holistic way. So, multiplicity of these factors which together reproduce hierarchies and inequalities in Indian society. So, they when explain Indian society and Indian reality do not rely or do not give primacy to one category over the other. So, there is no kind of prioritization of category or a kind of particular uh, kind of discrimination or the social cleavages. So, there is a kind of intersectional approach to understand how all these categories come together to create a power hierarchy or a power relationship. And then the approach to readdress these hierarchies or operations requires multifaceted approach and Lohia was arguing about such things. So, Raman or Lohia's approach was an intersectionalist. I will explain this word. Intersectionalist as I am saying take into account the multiplicities of categories which comes together to reproduce a matrix of power relationship which divide the society uh, and uh, create a kind of power hierarchy between and among the member of that society. Now, this kind of approach in sociology or in political science to understand different forms of exploitation or domination is becoming mo more and more relevant. But in the very beginning of uh, India's uh, uh, post-independent journey, Lohia took a very uh, intersectionalist approach to understand the uh, uh, dynamics of uh, caste and class in Indian uh, uh, condition. So, Raman or Lohia's approach was an intersectionalist one which dealt with the dynamics and the interrelations between or of caste, class, gender and language in reproducing and perpetuating inequalities, exploitation and exclusions in India. So, to understand these exploitation, exclusions 
or operations in India and how it get reproduced in everyday lives. Um, uh, Lohia had a very broader holistic or intersectionalist uh, approach to understand how these uh, categories be it caste and we, as we proceed in this lecture we come to know how caste produce the hierarchy and it aux oscillates between class and caste and caste with gender and how all these uh, together uh, uh, come, uh, come and relate with the issue of language whether uh, a ruling class in India is speaking English and that is the critique of Lohia and his struggle for Indian languages against the Angreji. So, his Angreji hatao or remove uh, uh, or abolish English was not uh, against a language per se. It was against a kind of status that is provided by those uh, provided to them who speak this language. So, the hierarchy that it constructs, Lohia had problem with that hierarchy. So, in, th in this way, Lohia's approach was a kind of holistic intersectionalist to understand the dynamics and the interrelationships of all these categories together and how they come together and construct a power matrix is something which Lohia was engaged in to understand or to explain and then to fight against. So, according to a sociologist professor Anand Kumar, he writes that Lohia's approach presented a multi-dimensional, differentiated and graded view of the structure of inequalities and exploitations in India. So, then he went uh, taking into account these categories did not essentialize anyone. So, uh, of course, um, uh, Lohia was um, for social equality or social justice, but the social inequality that is produced in India is so multi-layered and it has uh, so much of graded hierarchy or inequality that it requires more complex or uh, more uh, region specific. So, within India how caste operates in one uh, part of the country and same caste operate in a different fashion in different parts of the country. Lohia uh, was sensitive enough to, uh, to understand the specificities of the same categories working in different parts of the country and also how different categories caste, class, gender, language come together to produce a kind of hierarchy or a matrix of power which differentiate between the ruling uh, class or ruling elites and the masses. So, as Anand Kumar has rightly said that he presented a multi-dimensional approach not essentializing any category, but to see it in connection or in interrelationship with other such categories which reproduce hierarchy, which reproduce domination and differentiation. So, he presented a multi-dimensional differentiated and graded view therefore, to the structure of inequality and exploitations in India and therefore, Lohia is more uh, relevant even for contemporary politics or contemporary realities in society and perhaps more relevant today than he was writing about his views on caste or class. Now, his major works for today's class, the caste system and also Marx, Gandhi and Socialism which he wrote in 1963 is very relevant for uh, today's lecture, but his other works like Fragments of a World Mind or The Wheel of History, partly we have uh, discussed it from this in our previous lecture and also India, China and Northern Frontier. So, he has the passion or he share it with other modern Indian political thinkers about the role of India in the larger humanity and he argued for a world government or world parliament and consider himself as a world citizen. So, that uh, side of Loyo is also very much present uh, when he is talking about India specificities or uh, uh, conceptualizing the distinct socialism that should be applicable to India or critiquing Eurocentricism or reliance on Eurocentric concepts and methods. Yet, he is uh, also arguing for a kind of world government or the world parliament. So, beside these texts, Lohia also published some weekly magazines like Chokhamba and Jan, which is a monthly or Chokhamba, which was a weekly Hindi magazines. And also he published one as the name suggests and I was saying the mankind, 
this was an English monthly which he published through the writings and uh, therefore, uh, the uh, as I was saying uh, in this course again and again, the all the thinkers were deeply embedded in the politics of their time and so was Lohia and Loh Lohia is more distinct because of his uh, rebel nature or a rebel uh, socialist or a visionary thinker working uh, many times against the government policies, against the Prime Minister Nehru and many of his policies in the post-independent India. And uh, uh, while uh, being embedded in the politics, he had a very futuristic uh, vision for reconstructing Indian society and in that futuristic vision, he did not essentialize uh, uh, any uh, uh, categories or any particular section of uh, Indian society. So, he had a vision for reconstructing India or Indian society in a uh, new uh, way based on his philosophy or his understanding of um, uh, socialism. And this uh, visionary thinking in Lohia was embedded in uh, his practices. So, be it his writings, his pamphlets, his active involvement in the organizational politics of socialist party or Sanyukt Socialist Party forming an alliance against the Congress. In all these activities, he actually uh, represented a kind of um, 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 thinker deeply embedded in the politics of, um, uh, of uh, his time and yet uh, uh, reflective enough or visionary enough to think about the holistic uh, approach to the social problems or the uh, political or the global uh, challenges that uh, humanity as a whole uh, whole was facing and he provided a solution which was in many ways very innovative and original in comparison to the many scholars or scientists having a kind of derivative approach to the many of the uh, many of the uh, challenges that India was facing. So, through these writings, um, um, Lohia continued to um, present his views on many issues, social, political, specific to India or non-Western societies and also the global challenges that was happening. So, the capitalism, the, uh, the divide it produces or the communalism, the problem or the dead end in which it uh, entrapped itself and how it cannot be applicable to non-Western society, especially like India. Lohia uh, had the foresighted vision or thinking about many of such challenges. If you look at specifically about this issue of caste and class in Lohia, Lohia recognized caste as the primary form of inequality. So, for Lohia, the question of inequality, especially the economic inequality is the root cause of all kind of social exploitation or oppression in the society. So, that is the root, but he did not actually give primacy and therefore, he was actually fighting for social equality and social justice and his whole politics was oriented towards creating a society with less and less equality. And that less and less equality is not just between um, uh, economics on the economic sense, but also in the social or uh, cultural sense uh, also. So, the um, how to understand the inequality or the economic inequality in India? He argued that the uh, to understand uh, uh, economic inequality, you cannot just rely on the category of class as a uh, category to understand the economic inequality. You have to include into it the question of caste as well as gender and also the language to understand how inequality is produced and the social status attached to a particular uh, group or particular category operates in India or within India in different parts of India. So, he was having a more nuance, more objective or a kind of multiplicities uh, of uh, approach or a kind of um, um, understanding about uh, all these categories individually and then how it, they come together to reproduce uh, the exploitation or uh, inequalities in India. So, Lohia recognizes the caste, although the primary region or root cause of inequality in Indian society, which reflected in its culture, in its economy, in its polity or in its society. So, uh, he considered the caste as the primary form of equality and he shares with many radical social reformers who wanted caste to be eradicated 
and not to be reformed. So, unlike many scholars like uh, Gandhi and many others who are arguing about reforming the caste, uh, Lohia shares with Perrier, Ambedkar and many other social reformers that need to eradicate or destroy the caste system. So, caste system for him is the root cause of social inequality in India, but he did not essentialize it. And the understanding of the uh, caste is not uh, uh, without reducing all forms of inequality just to the caste. So, he had a kind of intersectionalist approach as I was arguing to see how caste operates in India and how it affects other sphere of uh, Indian lives but also how the caste operates, the same caste operates in different parts of India and how to understand the domination and subordination and the layers of graded inequality that it reproduces in everyday lives of Indian people. So, his understanding of caste as a primary root of all social or economic inequality, however, he did not essentialize the, uh, the concept of caste. So, Lohia's approach to caste and class question was very different from say many Marxist, contemporary Mar Marxist approach which solely focused on the dynamics of class and reduced other category uh, such as caste or gender as the secondary border. So, in many Marxist explanation or interpretation of Indian society, the premise is attached to the question of class and uh, caste and other forms of social hierarchy or social discrimination is given as some kind of secondary status or uh, in priority it comes second to the question uh, uh, or category of class. Lohia differs very substantially completely from this kind of prioritizing one form of inequality over the other and the problem with that kind of approach it misses the oscillations between caste and class especially in Indian society. So, his approach was distinct from the approaches of say Perrier or Ambedkar. So, he agreed with Perrier on the necessity of eliminating the caste because mere reforms will not help in reconstructing the society based on social equality or social justice. However, he differed from Perrier on many issues such as the violent anti-Brahmanism. So, uh, Lohia himself, Gandhian and Gandhi method of politics of non-violence or satyagraha had deep influence on Lohia. So much so that when socialist party government, uh, under the socialist party government there was uh, firing on the people, he actually asked uh, the socialist party to resign from the government. So, the non-violent method uh, as the uh, possible or as the most appropriate form of politics to reform or reconstruct the society uh, led Lohia even when he agreed with the overall objective of the caste politics and uh, to eradicate it, he uh, differed with Perrier on the question of the violence anti-Brahmanism and also his campaign against Gandhi or Indian constitution and also Hindi in the name of attacking caste system. So, he differed with Perrier also when he is in um, um, uh, agreement with the question of eradicating the caste system and not just uh, being satisfied with the reforming the caste system. So, his approach is also one can find very distinct from Ambedkar um, uh, where Lohia paid relatively more or greater attention to the aspect of gender or how uh, women among the backward classes uh, suffer double operations and uh, therefore, in the rise of uh, feminist movement and once again we find uh, Lohia far more uh, ahead of his times, we will come to discuss that when we talk uh, about his views on gender. But uh, uh, Indian feminism or Indian uh, feminist movement that we see in our contemporary times hardly take into account the views or writings of Lohia on the question of, of uh, gender. But uh, when he is um, articulating his response to the caste system, he differs from Perrier as I have just discussed, but also with Ambedkar because he uh, focuses or gave more attention to the question of um, uh, gender uh, based operation along with the caste. And in this regard, we find uh, Lohia's approach to the caste system is closer to Mahatma Phule or Jyotiba Phule. So, here on this question of caste and class as a category also, we find Lohia use these terms in their generic sense. Generic is a more uh, general and not specific to a society. So, these were not used in their specific 
connotation in Indian or Western context. So, suppose we say caste is only India specific or class is only result or consequences of the industrial development or capitalism or say uh, European or Western origin. For Lohia, he actually de-Indianized the caste or decolonized the caste, but also he de-Europeanized uh, the class as well. So, as uh, uh, Professor Anand Kumar is arguing that the, uh, in Lohia, the interpretation or the connotation of caste and class is done in a more innovative way to uh, make it applicable to understand the social realities in different, uh, different, uh, different, different countries in different contexts and not specific to a particular uh, society be it Indian or, uh, or Western or European. So, in um, uh, many societies in this more uh, generic sense where uh, caste uh, is a kind of immobile class or class is a mobile caste that uh, happens in all the societies, in most of the societies historically. So, he uh, argued Fed, uh, and make it a kind of maxim or a principle to understand the uh, social hierarchy or inequalities in India where there is a kind of oscillation between caste and class and there is a dynamic interrelationship between the two in terms of producing and perpetuating social inequalities and hierarchy. So, if you look at his views on the caste system, we can perhaps begin with his analysis of the consequences of the caste system on the nation as a whole or a society as a whole. So, he writes caste as I was saying the immobile class. So, caste restricts opportunity, restricted opportunity constricts ability, constricted ability further restricts opportunity. So, where caste prevails, opportunity and ability are restricted to ever narrowing circle of the people and that is the major reason for fragmentation in Indian society or social cleavages or the uh, caste operations or the privilege that is associated to particular caste or particular individual depending upon uh, their education or their uh, use of language, wealth or the caste status. So, we will discuss about this uh, divide between ruling class and the masses in India also, but uh, caste is a problem, caste is the biggest problem or impediment in creating a society which is based on social justice or social equality because it restricts opportunity. So, there is a kind of reduction or in a kind of restriction in the opportunity that is available to different caste or different uh, groups. So, caste restricts opportunity. So, some opportunity or most of the opportunities are open to only a particular limited caste. That uh, restriction of opportunity also constricts the ability and this constricted ability further restricts the opportunity where then where caste people, opportunity and ability are restricted to ever narrowing circles of the people. So, there is a gradual concentration of power uh, among the fewer and fewer uh, people in the uh, hierarchy uh, and that he uh, see, saw as a problem for not just uh, creating a new society or uh, uh, constructing or transforming the existing hierarchy uh, or uh, social exploitations but also to democratize the all sphere of society including the power relationship or power that flows from top to bottom or bottom to top. So, on this question of inequality to which uh, Lohia argued again and again and considered it as the root cause of all the problems, all the challenges that India or a humanity as a whole was facing and he considered 20th century in many ways is a revolution against all kind of operations and um, exploitations be it caste based, class based, um, um, ideology based, political domination of one country over the other, all uh, there is a kind of uh, or gender specific exploitation. So, there is a kind of multifaceted approach or fight or revolution against all these forms of solution and that is something which he considered unique in the 20th century, uh, uh, century history. So, the caste in that uh, approach prevent the opening up 
of uh, opportunity and allowing the ability to realize its uh, potential because of this restriction based on caste and that creates a problem which leads to a ever narrowing circle of the people which enjoy enormous power and have great status attached to that power. So, he regarded caste as both a discriminating social structure and a disabling cultural phenomena and that is intertwined in his analysis. So, it is not just about a particular status of individual in the society, but also there is a whole cultural, political and material benefits associated with one's caste identity and that is uh, the major problem which he thought. So, caste with its inherent inequality, stratification and cruelty have resulted in dehumanization of both the oppressed and the oppressive castes and is responsible for the fragmentation of Indian society. So, caste which is inherently based on inequality or stratification or demonization of one caste over the other or how a superior caste see its inferior with contempt. That is the uh, major problem which leads to dehumanization of both the oppressed and oppressive and there we see a kind of similar approach to the um, uh, Ambedkar's approach to this whole question of caste which prevent a kind of public opinion or a morality which transcend the caste uh, based limited uh, sense of ethics, loyalty or morality to uh, 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 in Indian society. So, Lohi also believes that because of this inherent inequality, stratification and cruelty in the caste system, it leads to dehumanization of both the oppressed and the oppressive and is responsible for the fragmentation of Indian society. And he considered the presumed superiority of mental work over manual work that is the basis or the uh, notion of pure or pollution and a relation of pure with the mental work or the intellectual work and pollution with the manual work that is involved. He was very critical of this uh, notion of superiority or inferiority on the basis of the work be it mental or the manual. He considered that unnatural and he regarded that there is nothing like a pure mental or manual work and uh, the value of this work. And here is a kind of Gandhian approach to uh, regard all uh, forms of labor with same respect or with dignity also in Lohia. So, Lohia thought that the destruction of this inhuman system was not easy because of its layered and graded nature of inequality. It required a multi-dimensional or multi-faceted attacks on the philosophical, religious, political, historical, economic and the social roots of the caste system. So, there cannot be a kind of one unidimensional or uh, a kind of selective or limited approach to root or this inhuman system of caste based discrimination or inequality in India. So, he wanted to have a kind of multifaceted approach often in alignment with other categories such as gender or language or class to uh, root out this whole problem of caste system in India. However, Lohia is very sensitive as I was arguing about this plurality or multiplicities of caste experiences in different parts of country. So, just being anti-Brahminical does not uh, uh, necessarily lead to the uh, 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 eradication of caste or fighting the whole system as such. So, although the caste existed in almost all of India, caste in its form and operation differs across the regions and therefore, he stressed on the necessity of region specific approach to eliminate caste system. So, there is no kind of simplistic one size fit all kind of approach or a kind of universal approach to uh, solve the caste problem. So, he uh, uh, having a kind of objective and as I was discussing in my previous lecture, the focus on the present and the present act and every act should justify its, its action or the consequences of its action, the ethical or the moral basis. So, the politics in uh, Lohia in that sense is a more a kind of aesthetic act a moral act to reform the society and not about power or not about holding the office, but to helping in the transformation of the society to create or to make it more just or more equal. So, um, in doing that, 
uh, 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 Lohia did not uh, carry the colonial baggage or the kind of uh, easy formula of using caste or its category as uh, classified by the administration or the colonial administration. He saw it in different parts of the country and he saw its operation and its functioning differ from region to region. So, one uh, group may be uh, subordinated in some part, but in the other part they may be a dominant or the hegemonic, uh, hegemonic group. Uh, uh, Lohia was arguing about to have a kind of region spe specific approach to the caste problem and to eliminate it also. So, in his book The Caste System, Lohia writes uh, that 90 percent of the Indian population constitute backward sections or what he calls backward class. So, remember the first backward class commission by Kaka Kelkar commission uh, submitted the report, but it was not uh, approved or accepted because of the problem in identifying or there are many contestation in identification of a group as a backward caste or a, as a backward class. So, in the backdrop of such discourse, Lohia was arguing about that 90 percent of Indian people including among those who are poor among the Dwiz or the so called upper caste and also certainly backward castes like SCs, STs, also uh, the women or the uh, minorities in the Christian or the religious minorities communities th that constitute his overall understanding of backward classes in India which he argued is about 90 percent of the population and that 90 percent of government jobs and industry is controlled by the rich 10 percent of the population and that is his stand political critique against the hegemony of upper caste and that leads to some kind of you know as I was arguing about a silencing about Lohia and his works certainly after his death. But as long as he lived till 1967 he prepared the ideological and the organizational basis for this uh, rise of upper caste uh, movement as we see and we have argued that Christophe Jaffer led talking about the silent revolution in India. So, uh, Lohia uh, should be credited to providing the base for uh, such kind of politics or political leadership to emerge and he, uh, he was in many ways um, uh, the uh, propagator of such kind of uh, such kind of politics and uh, rightly so he is now and then there is a problem also then uh, with the OBC movement uh, it is just the Lohia who is attributed uh, not just Lohia but uh, his politics or his organizational um, um, uh, work or ideological uh, positions uh, are attributed for the uh, emergence of Mandal kind of uh, politics or the um, uh, reservation for the OBCs. But the overall or the holistic approach in Lohia is somewhat which is missing and we need to re-engage with such kind of politics in Lohia when we argue about his stand for reservation and why he is demanding that reservation and overall objective for such uh, preferential treatment is to construct a society which is more uh, just and equal. So, this concentration of power in the hands of upper caste men according to Lohia had paralyzed this country. Therefore, he pushed for the entry of the depressed sections of society or backward classes of society into public life and administration through preferential treatment and demanded therefore, 60 percent of reservation for the backward classes of society barring some specialized services like surgery uh, which requires a specific expertise. So, he preferred this reservation not as a tool of individual selfish development, but as the means of social equality and advancement of national prosperity. So, that is the overall objective which he wanted to achieve and in that sense we see a kind of uh, democratic or democratic imaginaries in uh, Lohia and his thought where he wanted power to be uh, diffused or decentralization of power and maximum participation of um, uh, different sections especially from the backward classes which is underrepresented uh, or the over um, uh, domination of uh, a one section of uh, society on the administration on the public and the political life. Lohia was arguing against such kind of domination or concentration of power or exercise of power by that section that minority section over the large 
or the majority of the masses. So, his argument is more or can or should be seen more towards a kind of democratization of politics, administration through representation or through adequate representation of different sections and not just a kind of selfish individualistic aggrandizement kind of thing. So, to remove the caste barrier, uh, Lohia also argued for inter-caste marriages or inter-caste marriage as the basis for the creation of such society based on equality and justice. So, he wanted the government to take necessary measures to promote inter-dining or inter-caste marriages, which is very similar to Ambedkar's kind of approach as we have discussed. And since there were practical limitations on the part of a state to make inter-caste marriage obligatory, he wanted the state to provide preferential treatment to the parties involved in inter-caste marriages for a specific period. So, to eradicate the caste system or the inhuman inequalities produced and reproduced by the caste system, he also championed the cause of inter-dining or inter-marriages. And he sought the uh, role of a state in, um, in providing or facilitating such, uh, such marriages. So, uh, we can also find then, then his approach to the caste system was not anti-Brahmin or anti-Brahminical rhetoric. So, often in the caste based politics or movement, you see a kind of overall focus to root out or to attack the Brahminical uh, or the Brahminical um, uh, uh, forces or the, uh, the Brahminical traditions or the um, uh, intellectual works. Uh, Lohia is not uh, uh, someone who is arguing for fighting for anti-caste as a kind of anti-Brahminical stand. So, reflecting on the limitation of anti-Brahmin approach as the medium of eliminating caste system, Lohia writes and this he writes about the South Indian anti-Brahminical movement. So, I never been anti-Brahmin and I have almost always been anti-caste. So, being anti-caste is not equal to being anti-Brahmin. But I made a slight mistake in imagining that the anti-Brahminism of the South could be transformed into anti-caste in the rich part of the country. So, the ruling elements among the Reddies, Mudaliars and Nayars have in the past 50 years been anti-Brahmin only to come abreast of the Brahmins and now that they have done so, at least politically they appear to be settled, they are satisfied with that uh, thing. And they have given up their ideology of reservations and are now as much against the so called communal government's order as were once Brahmins. He saw the limitation in this kind of anti-Brahminical stand or movement where one group replaces the other, but the uh, whole objective of such replacement is uh, forgotten or uh, betrayed once the other group uh, acquire that power and that does not help in uh, destroying the caste system to begin with. And that was the major objective which Lohia is arguing about. So, Lohia for him the eradication of caste in conclusion one can say requires the uh, multifaceted approach and uh, 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 the, there is a kind of um, interrelationship between other categories, we now uh, discuss his views on caste and gender. So, Lohia is among the few anti-caste thinker who was able to draw the interrelationship between caste and gender operations. His articulation of backward classes, he included women of all caste as backwards. And his emphasis on women question, one can infer from the point that on the equality between men and women was the first and foremost principle of Saptakranti that he advocated and we will discuss this notion of uh, Saptakranti later. So, as I was saying that the intersectionalist approach in him to understand different forms of operations or exploitation and the interrelationship between them allow him to see the question of gender as a uh, problem as perhaps is the caste. So, the women he consider as the part of backward class no matter what is their caste background. So, women from all caste backgrounds are part of backward class because of there is a um, uh, discrimination or exploitation on the basis of gender in all the caste uh, groups in Indian society. So, he argued that Indian women especially depressed castes is doubly subjugated by these two factors of caste and also gender 
he considered this double operations responsible for the decline of spirit of India or the public spirit or the collectivities where there is a uh, educated representation of different caste but also the half of the population that is gender. So, he regarded gender discrimination and oppression as the biggest impediment in the realization of an egalitarian society and that is why he argued for main women in uh, equality as the first and foremost principle of his idea of Saptakranti or seven revolutions. So, in order to root out this double operations, Lohia focused on the four key areas and these are slavery of the kitchen and the field of sanitation, also the re-examination of institution of marriage and the hypocrisy that is involved in decision about marriage, equality in education and property rights and also preferential treatment in politics and employment for the women. So, Lohia is arguing about all these four, uh, four uh, areas uh, to remove the gender inequalities or gender operations in Indian society and this he is doing in 1960s or 1950s that is something which is far ahead of his time. So, uh, uh, so uh, the tragedy is or the unfortunate part of it is when we uh, see the discourse or political scholarly debates and discussion on feminism or feminist movement in India, there is very less engagement with his thoughts and ideals of um, uh, women. Uh, uh, question and he was also arguing for Indian tradition or uh, there have been different movements in Indian tradition for eradication of caste and for uh, the uh, higher status of uh, women or equal status of women in the public life and he cited the examples of uh, 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 many uh, women um, uh, thinkers or, uh, um, um, or uh, legendary figures from the in Indian past, so Draupadi or uh, Maitri or many uh, Bharati and many other examples he cites. Uh, and so, uh, with the caste operations and the caste question, he thought that the Indian tradition and Indian um, um, uh, culture has the potentiality to, to fight against such uh, operations or discriminations. So, now if you look at his views on India's ruling class. So, while defining the ruling class in India, Lohia adopted an inclusive approach composite of socio-culture, political and economic factors. So, in his views, the ruling class in India can be defined or identified by three distinct characteristics. First, high caste, second is English education and third is wealth. Now, he considers that any individual which uh, has any of the two criteria out of uh, three, he is part of the ruling class. So, presence of any two of these can provide individual the entry to the ruling class. So, either upper caste or English education or English education or wealth or in any formula, the any of the two characteristic will allow the individual entry into the ruling class in India. Here, he did not include women of any caste as I was arguing. So, women from all caste is part of backward classes according to Lohia's formulation of power relationship in, in, in society. So, he thought that women of all classes are exploited to certain extent that restrict their entry to the realm of ruling classes. So, throughout his life, through his politics and writings, Lohia tried to bridge this gap or divide between the ruling classes or elite and the masses of Indian society. And that gives us to reformulate perhaps the democratic imaginary in Lohia without reducing him merely as the spokesperson of the OBC or uh, any particular uh, uh, groups. So, and his holistic approach and multifaceted struggles towards the intersection of caste, class, gender, language discriminations were aimed at creating a new socialist egalitarian society guided by the principle of horizontal solidarity in place of vertical solidarity based on caste, wealth or uh, education, especially English education and twin principle of social equality and social justice. So, that is his overall holistic approach towards creating or reconstructing a society from a scratch which is based on this horizontal solidarity and 
principle, principle of social equality and justice. Now, briefly, if you look at his views on socialism, which is very distinct and Lohia is more innovative and uh, very original in his articulation of socialism for uh, 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 non-Western societies, especially for India. So, uh, and one of the speech becomes the basis for such articulation and is also his work like Marx, Gandhi and socialism. Uh, he uh, gave this redefinition or re-articulation of socialism in India in his presidential speech to the Panchamari Convention of the Socialist Party in 1952. And he uh, spoke there that no greater disaster could befall socialism than if the historical peculiarities of its career in Europe were sought to be universalized and reproduce in the other two thirds of the world. So, now this is a kind of move away from Eurocentricism in Lohia and that is why Lohia becomes a very fascinating or important figure to engage with to understand the specificities of different societies to understand their politics or to interpret their realities. So, he uh, 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 in this speech we will discuss how he tried to uh, uh, innovatively reconstruct or reformulate the socialism for India or non-Western society and he was very critical against blind imitation of a ideology emerge in a peculiar condition of or the historical peculiarities in Europe and then it tries to be universalized. So, there is a kind of belief in many progressive so called thinkers and intellectuals that something that emerges in any part of the country will gradually spread different parts of the world and it is uh, 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 it re result in the um, uh, betterment or transformation of society. In France. Lohia was very critical of such kind of arguments about the blind imitations or following of an ideals which emerge in a particular uh, historical specificities of a part of uh, the humanity or the world. So, uh, Lohia was very critical of such kind of blind imitation. So, in his socialism, the social equality and social justice were the cardinal principle of Lohia's politics and philosophy. And to achieve that, he argued that socialism was the only way forward to create a society, to transform a society which is based on the principle of social justice and social equality. However, Lohia believed that for too long the doctrine of socialism is strived on borrowed breath. Borrowed breath is that historical experience in one society is tried to be replicated or reproduced in other societies. So, he argued that for too long the doctrine of socialism strived on the borrowed breath and lagged behind the ideology of both communism and capitalism. So, from communism, socialism had taken the economic aims of planned economy or social ownership or mass production and from capitalism, it uh, developed its general concerns, say uh, democracy, freedom and peace. So, uh, many people have this kind of blending in socialism and when they talk about socialism, they think of it as a kind of queer mixture of capitalism and communism that is blended together. Lohia argued for a distinct and innovative conceptualization of socialism independent from both communism and capitalism. And in this connection, his presidential speech at the Socialist Party Convention in 1952 at Panchmari on the doctrinal foundation of socialism. That becomes the basis of all his philosophy or politics in post-independent India till his death in 1967 is regarded as one of the finest political speech in post-independent India. And in this speech, he criticized the prevailing ideological confusion in socialist party that oscillates between Nehruvian Congress on the one hand and communist on the other. He charted out a new and independent vision of socialism in India and he was very critical of the democratic socialism and asserted that socialism stood for a distinct idea that needed no prefix or suffix. So, socialism uh, was a kind of emerging force or a dominant, not as dominant perhaps as say other ideological forces, but it had the promise of providing the alternative to the domination of the Congress party or the Congress rule. 
and Lohia was articulating about the uh, possible um, method or the politics to achieve uh, or to provide that alternative which will help in the democratization of state, polity and society also. Now to do that he wanted to have a kind of doctrinal clarity about the vision of uh, socialism which has for long relied upon the borrowed ideas such as communism or capitalism and the queer mixture of that. And also in India specifically between the Nehruvian Congress which is also tilted towards the socialism or socialist reconstruction of uh, society. And uh, uh, this is also a point we need to recall that uh, Nehru and Lohia was a close uh, collaborator during the freedom struggle movement. So within the Congress they were uh, 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 involved in the freedom struggle and they shared a lot of ideas about reconstruction of society or socialist ideals also. So, uh, this confusion Lohia believed is the major reason that obstruct the growth and the prospect of socialist uh, party which also lead to a kind of serious differences with many other leaders like JP or many other socialist uh, leaders and split in the socialist party. But Lohia continued to practice his distinct understanding of socialism and socialism as a way forward for reconstruction of Indian society and he by and large succeeded in forging that alignment of different forces and he also influenced artists, writers and literary figures and uh, shaped their ideas in many ways. And in 1967 because of his premature death there is a kind of betrayal also of uh, Lohia, uh, Lohia ideals but he did provide socialist uh, politics and he therefore therefore criticized both and also the communist ideas. So, to realize his dream of socialism, of socialism Lohia argued the seven revolution is the basis for the realization Kranti's equality between men and women against the political, economic and a spiritual inequality based on color or race for the destruction of castes against foreign domination and democratic world government for economic equality, plant production and against private property, against interference in private life and for democratic method and finally against arms and weapons and for Satyagraha. So, there is a kind of overall articulation about how to uh, reconstruct a socialist society by achieving these seven revolution. And that seven revolution is for him a kind of simultaneous struggle, not one after the other, but it should have a kind of holistic approach to reconstruct or transform the society. So, Lohia developed his idea of socialism with a special reference to the third world countries. And he stated that the economic aims proposed by both communism and capitalism is not applicable in these society or countries, although differs in the means both communism and capitalism urges for large scale production through the use of technology and it demands a huge amount of capital which is not possible for the underdeveloped countries and the third world. And the other point is there is a less focus on the question of labor, alienation of labor, the control of labor over its product and uh, the ownership is in capitalism with the individual, the private citizen or in the communism with the state. But the structure of production or the mass production use of technology is something which is very similar in both modes of production and he therefore realized that it is not helpful in creating the socialist society in the third world society. So therefore these countries should develop their own method of socialism in accordance with the specificities of their context and Lohia himself proposed an alternative model of socialism which is decentralized in its nature decentralized in terms of both in the use of technology and power and that comes the next uh, theme in Lohia which is also called Chaukhambharas. This is about a kind of democratic imaginary in Lohia where he talks about decentralization in technology by which he meant the use of small scale machinery and also decentralization of power which is represented in the idea of four pillar of a state or Chaukhambharas. Chaukhamba Raj in Lohia is constitutive of four layers of power or the ownership with the village, the district, the province 
and the center. So, these four layers are the uh, way uh, forward for the uh, decentralization of power and ensuring maximum participation at different levels of uh, governance. So, he was not in favor of private property, but he was also thought that the exclusive ownership of property in the hands of the center is equally harmful. So, the concentration of wealth or the uh, resources and therefore, he argued that property should be owned by all these four pillars of a state and not to be concentrated in the hands of the center. So, there is a kind of democratization or decentralization of power and also technology in Lohia's uh, understanding of uh, Chakambara's or and that allow us to think about alternative imaginary of democracy, state and society in Lohia. So, Lohia advocated constructive action and peaceful non-violent resistance, even collective disobedience against exploitation and injustice. So, against all form of violence, he was very critical of and that is the Gandhian influence. And also in this Chakambar, as you see the influence of Gandhi in his idea about uh, decentralization of power. So, he provided the ideological and organizational basis of the realization of such ideals as I was arguing. So, however, much of these ideals remain unrealized and betrayed even mainly many of his followers and the political successor and even there has been for long a conspicuous silence about critically engaging with the ideas and writings of uh, Lohia and now therefore, is the time to revisit some of his ideals and writings to understand our society, the challenges it is facing of different kinds and not having uh, necessary to reduce or give priority to one form of exploitation or uh, uh, oppression over the other. So, there is a kind of uh, uh, holistic or intersectionalist approach uh, to reconstruct the society as a whole and then to see its role in the larger global uh, politics or um, its, uh, uh, its global uh, role. So, even in uh, contemporary times, you find many scholars argue about one category and through that category they tries to interpret and uh, uh, explain Indian reality be it caste, class, gender, ethnicity, religion. But uh, in Lohia you will find a kind of uh, interconnections or dynamic interrelationship as the basis to understand the matrix of power that operates at different level of Indian society and polity and then how to challenge, how to um, um, confront such power dynamics that is there in the Lohia and one of the strong um, um, uh, message that comes out of his approach is the democratization of all sphere of life including strengthening or empowering the women or the backward uh, classes. So, focus on the uh, preferential treatment of backward classes is to reconstruct a society as a whole to make it more just and equal and that is something which we can further um, develop or uh, requires engagement with his writings. So, that is all on, so, that's all on uh, this lecture on caste, class and socialism and you can refer to some of these works like caste system or Marx, Gandhi and socialism by Raman or Lohia and also understanding Lohia's political sociology, intersectionality of caste, class, gender and language by Anand Kumar and also by A. A. Padurai, recent socialist thought in India and some of these works like in Lohia's contribution to socialist politics in India by Kesava Rao and also Raja Ram Tolpadi, context, discourse and vision of Lohia's socialism and Lohia's socialism and underdog's perspective by Sachidanand Sinha and also Lohia's quest for an autonomous socialism by Adi H. Doctor, which you can uh, refer to understand some of the themes we have discussed in this lecture. So, thank you for your listening and that is all for today's lecture. Thank you.